Season 1, Episode 4 of Black History Moments. This podcast is dedicated to telling the stories of those forgotten, those Black historical figures of our past who may not have gotten the credit that I felt that they deserved during the time that they were here and during the periods following. Today is the story of Gladys Bentley. During the 1920s, the Harlem Renaissance was going into full swing, and Gladys Bentley was a gender-bending performer who was a prominent figure in the community during her time for Black people, gay people, and trans people alike. This is her story. I'm sure many, if not all of us, have heard or know about the Harlem Renaissance era. The Harlem Renaissance era was a movement. It was an artistic explosion of social activists, artists, writers, all types of creative people during the 1920s. And not only was it located in Harlem, but it was also happening simultaneously in Manhattan of New York City. So during this era, I feel like we hear so much about different writers such as Langston Hughes, W.E.B. Du Bois, Zora Neale Hurston. We also hear about different artists and performers like Louis Armstrong and Josephine Baker, but rarely do we hear this particular name, which is Gladys Bentley. And I feel like she was just as important and pivotal to the movement as those that I just mentioned. While Gladys's story is one of triumph and one of a brave person refusing to conform to societal norms, she also had a side near the end of her life that kind of became a mystery and where she started to conform to societal norms for more acceptance and may have been dealing with some mental illness or mental health issues during this era. So here's her story. So, Gladys Bentley was born August 12, 1907 to her mother, Mary Bentley, who was originally from Trinidad, and her father, George Bentley, who was American-born. She was raised in Philadelphia, although some sources say that she may have not been from Philadelphia, that she may have originally been from Port of Spain, Trinidad, but for the most part, people believe that she was born and raised in Philadelphia. She was the oldest of four siblings, and she remembered her childhood as being an unhappy experience. She said that from an early age, her parents noticed that she was attracted to women. And during this time, please remember that this is the early 1900s, and this is completely not acceptable in the culture, right? We have come such a long way, thank God. However, during this time, they noticed that she may have been expressing some attraction to women, and she poured her frustrations into her music. Gladys would continue to develop her songwriting skills, her abilities playing the piano and also singing, before she moved to New York City at the age of 16 in 1923. So during this time, the Harlem Renaissance had definitely kicked off, so she's a little bit late to the party, but she did not let that stop her. Immediately, she started performing at different house parties that were around town, and New York City was really, you know, in full gear. Almost everywhere you turned, there was a party going on somewhere. I mean, they were partying it up during the 1920s in Harlem. So Bentley, she started performing at different house parties that were going on around town. And these different house parties were called buffet flats. These were extremely um, risque, I guess we'll say, clubs that were usually occurring in different brownstones. And they offered music, alcohol, gambling, and also prostitution. After performing at these little hole-in-the-wall, I hate to call them that, but <laughs> venues for a while, Gladys eventually tried her hand at becoming a nightclub performer. And the first venue that she performed at was called The Madhouse, where she auditioned. It was over on 133rd Street, and they needed a male pianist. So the boss, when she showed up that day to audition, they were reluctant to even let her try, but they really needed a pianist, and she convinced them to give her a try. She sat down at the piano, and after she finished her first number, the crowd just went wild. They loved it so much. So the thing to know about Gladys was that she was not afraid of breaking down social norms and being explicit at times. So one of the things that people loved so much about her was that she didn't dress like the 
air quotes, regular woman at the time. Gladys would often wear, actually all the time, she would wear suits. She would wear stiff white collars under the suits, bow ties, oxfords, short Edson jackets, and she would wear her hair cut straight back like a man. And the audiences loved this because it was so different from what they were seeing in Josephine Baker and other different performers at this time. And she would have these raunchy and explicit lyrics. She would convert popular songs during the time and change the lyrics and make them so raunchy and explicit. But the audiences loved it. It's what made her unique. Oftentimes during her performances, she would use the time to flirt with women in the audiences. She would often be advertised as a male impersonator when the different venues would advertise her on their different flyers around town for the shows that they had coming up during the week. They would have her as a male impersonator, but that's not exactly what she was. She identified as a gay performer. So it wasn't that she was impersonating men. That wasn't what she was doing. She was actually attracted to women. But still, remember, this is the early 1920s. So Langston Hughes, he actually saw her perform a few times and he wrote about her and said that she was, quote, an amazing exhibition of musical energy, a large, dark, masculine lady whose feet pounded the floor while her fingers pounded the keyboard, a perfect piece of African sculpture animated by her own rhythm. So eventually, Gladys got really, really popular around New York City, and she started performing at the Clam House. The Clam House was Harlem's most popular gay-friendly speakeasy, and it was located on 133rd Street, and it was nicknamed Swing Street for its countless underground clubs. And she became a main attraction on this street. People came to 133rd Street to look for Gladys Bentley because she was so popular. Her reputation literally took off. And for Gladys, with fame came money. So she also began recording different songs during the 1920s and also the 1930s. But none of her recordings really captured how vulgar she could be during her performances, her live performances. And she wasn't widely played on the radio during this time. But she also became a fixture in clubs across New York City, Harlem, Manhattan, and other parts. And she toured nationally as well. So at her peak, she wrote an essay for Ebony Magazine, and she was living on Park Avenue with a team of servants. She was paying $300 a month in rent. This is in the 1920s. And $300 in rent back then is equivalent to about $5,000 today. She was also driving a luxury car and she told reporters that she had married a white woman in a ceremony in New Jersey. So this is way before the legalization of gay marriage, same-sex couples. So it was a big to-do at the time. Although there is no public record of this ceremony or who the woman's identity was, it never became public. But this is just something that she said occurred. So she also became a performer for the Cotton Club, and she also appeared many times at the Apollo Theater. And she also held a residency at a club on Park Avenue in Midtown. So Gladys is a woman about town. She is performing everywhere. However, this was during the Prohibition era. So it was very lax in terms of monitoring different alcohol and different clubs within the city. But once the Prohibition era was over, less and less white people started to frequent those clubs and those areas because there was no need to anymore. <laughs> like alcohol is readily available anywhere. So they stopped going to those clubs. And with the Prohibition era coming to an end, it was also less tolerated for someone like Gladys Bentley, someone who was openly gay and attracted to someone of the same sex. So that was less acceptable in the eyes of society, which is kind of counterintuitive now that I think about it because how is it that as time progresses her lifestyle and who she's attracted to is less acceptable counterintuitive to me but that's just one woman's opinion so she left New York City for Los Angeles in 1937 and there she became a leading entertainer in the Bay Area so there there was a club called Mona's 440 Club, and it was the first lesbian bar in San Francisco, and it became her home club or home for performing for a while. Now, while Gladys was still able to be a little bit of her old self while performing at Mona's 440 Club, she 
also performed at different clubs around town where she started to wear skirts and dresses because this ran into the McCarthy era. And the McCarthy era was basically a hostile time period to live in because it claimed that homosexuality and communism were the largest threats to the country. Crazy, right? Yes. So she started to tone down a lot and she started to repress who she actually was as a person. In 1952, she wrote an article for Ebony Magazine, which is a very sad article if you have the time to read it. I do encourage you to read it because, you know, while it is sad, it is, I guess you can say a testament to how far we've come, but also a reminder of just how far we have to go. So in this article, she claimed that she had undergone medical treatment to awaken her, quote, womanliness. And she also claimed that she had married twice, although one of the men that she claimed to have married denied that he had ever been married to her. And accompanying the essay, they also had a photo spread of different pictures. I am going to link the essay I did find it online, but I'm going to link it if I can find it again in the description of the podcast so you can check it out for yourself. But along with the essay, they had different photos of her ironing clothes, preparing meals for her husband who was supposed to be coming home, wearing dresses and flowers in her hair, basically being this homemaker that was the image of women during this time. And it's just so odd to me how she went from being herself so unapologetically and then it was almost like time rewind and she had to become someone completely different to be able to perform or make money anymore in the country because of the McCarthy era and what was going on. So she had to reinvent herself. But I am going to link that Ebony Magazine article to this podcast episode if you want to check it out. Okay, so she said that she had undergone hormone treatment to cure her homosexuality and she identified as heterosexual now. She claimed that she was married and she eventually started touring more around the country and she wanted to become an ordained minister for a church. However, she did not tour nearly as much as she did in the 1920s and the early 1930s during the Prohibition era and before the McCarthy era when homosexuality was shunned in our country. Eventually, Gladys wrote an autobiography in 1958 and it was entitled If This Be Sin. She actually appeared on television and said that she had written this autobiography about her life. However, it was never published because she passed two years later in 1960 from complications of the flu. Some sources say the flu and some sources say pneumonia and she passed at the age of 52 while she was still studying to become that minister. I will argue that during the peak of her celebrity, during the Harlem Renaissance era, Gladys Bentley was a super pivotal figure for gay, homosexual, and trans individuals during this time because she was able to convey who they were as people with acceptance from others who may not have understood it completely. And she was also an entertainer who should have been celebrated just as much as Josephine Baker, Louis Armstrong, and others during the Harlem Renaissance era. So I would like for us to remember Gladys Bentley and her legacy and also the scenes that she cultivated for black people, gay people, trans people and homosexual people alike, because she is just as important and her story is just as important as others that we tend to celebrate more often. Remember that you too are black history and hopefully we'll see you next Friday at 9 a.m. for a new episode of Black History Moments.